a very good morning to all of the participants and our honorable speaker dr animesh das uh, let me present the slide today uh, we are having dr animesh das with us who will be delivering lecture on the principles of soft structure design of bituminous pavements uh, let me give you a brief bio of dr animesh das dr animesh das is a professor in the department of civil engineering iit kanpur his area of interest is pavement material characterization analysis design and evaluation he has co-authored a textbook titled principles of transportation engineering which has been published in the year 2003 by the apprentice hall of india he has authored another book titled analysis of payment structures published by crc press under the taylor and francis group in 2014 he has received numerous awards in recognition to the contribution in his field to name a few young engineers award in 2004 from indian national academy of engineers IRC Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Award in 2006 from Indian Roads Congress, Fulbright Nehru Scholars Senior Research Fellowship in 2012 by United States India Education Foundation. Participants, Dr. Das would be delivering lecture on principles of structural design of bituminous pavement in the morning session today of. the stc named prospects of sustainability in payment construction in india so without uh, uh, putting further adieu to this course i would now request dr das to take over the charge and uh, start his lecture so uh, dr das now thank you uh, for the introduction so Uh, i shall be speaking on principles of structural design of bituminous pavements by structural design in general terms uh, we mean estimation of the thicknesses so if there is a pavement it is made up of multiple layers so we need to know their thicknesses uh, and that's what we do in structural design so once structural design is done we can refer it for the construction purpose and for performing structural design we need to do analysis of the pavement structure we also need to know the traffic parameters and the design life and while we do analysis we also should have the material parameters which can be which will be used as analysis purpose uh, sometimes uh, the pavement is already built so on an existing pavement if we want to do a rehabilitation we need to evaluate the strength existing strength uh, of the pavement and this information is fed uh, to the analysis scheme and used for the structural design purpose so essentially we have certain parameters which are known like the material property the traffic parameters and the design life and we have the thickness values of the individual layers as unknown so a bituminous pavement which is made up of multiple layers say 1 2 3 4 5 layers then the thickness values of these layers h1 h2 h3 h4 are our unknowns uh, this can be done uh, empirically that means uh, there could be you know experience based uh, design templates which can be directly used that means you know the kind of soil and you know the traffic which is expected and you know the kind of thicknesses uh, have survived and you provide that thickness so these are like pure experience based empirical methods the method that i'll be discussing is rather a popular method which is known as mechanistic empirical pavement method so coming back to a design principle for any civil engineering structure uh, be it a dam be it a slope stability column design or a beam design or anything like that what we do essentially is to we compute the stresses or strains at the critical locations and we check that their values should be lower than the allowable values if we can bring a quick analogy to a design of a beam uh, suppose the beam is subjected to uniformly distributed load then we know there would be a location where the critical 
bending stress will become critical and there would be a location where the shear stress will be critical. So we compute those stresses, we find out, we check whether the these stress values are lower than the allowable value and if not then we adjust the dimensions of the beam and then accordingly we design it. Uh, bituminous pavement uh, being a flexible structure, it is said from the failure theories that uh, it is these the strain values are rather more critical and that governs the design and not really the stress value so we can say the computed strain at critical location should be lower than the alpha values now it may not be one particular location or one particular uh, kind of a strain it can be different locations so we can say that the computed strains at critical locations should be lower than their respective allowable values so we have certain terms which needs to be elaborated, a computed strength. The question is how do we compute strength? Of course we compute the strengths by performing analysis. Uh, where are these critical locations? This is what I shall be talking in the subsequent slides. The uh, computed strength value should be lower than that of the allowable. The question is how much is the margin? Well, it cannot be of course higher because if it is higher then the structure is unsafe. It cannot be too low as well because if it is too low then the structure as we know is going to be over safe design and therefore it will be uneconomical. And uh, we check while we perform design that uh, the computed strain values should be lower than the allowable values. The question is how much uh, is this uh, allowable value and this is what also we will be discussing next. So, in the structural design process, therefore, uh, we first we have to assume a thickness, and that acts as an that is used in the for the analysis purpose because we need to know both the material property and the thickness to start with, to do to be able to do analysis, and we check whether the computed strain is less than equal to uh, the allowable strain value. And if this design check is satisfied, then we can of course finalize the design and we can refer it for construction and rehabilitation, whatever may be the case. And if it is no, like any other design process, we need to iterate. That means we need to adjust the thicknesses. While I said that uh, from the traffic parameters and the design life, we obtain the uh, traffic reputations, uh, there are a lot of other factors which are associated. For example, uh, different vehicles will be having different wheel and axle configuration, they will have different tire contact pressure, uh, the, their axle loads will become different and different volume of traffic that will flow on the pavement that we are thinking to design. So I am not going to discuss uh, all these individual factors in details but overall what we do is that we have different approaches to take into account these factors and combine them and we are in a position to calculate uh, what would be the cumulative traffic and we express that in terms of standard axle load repetitions. So uh, we notice that from the analysis we obtain this uh, computed strain and from these cumulative standard axle repetitions we obtain the allowable strain values. But one thing needs to be discussed further here that as the pavement uh, gets deteriorated uh, due to application of traffic repetitions, the material property also changes because that is what the deterioration would mean. Now it is uh, difficult to some extent maybe uh, to consider how the material will gradually deteriorate over time. So one idea is to uh, take uh, the material property values at the start and try to relate it with the end situation when the pavement fails. The another idea is to split it into different uh, small time zones and try to see that how the material is gradually deteriorated. Uh, this deterioration is also caused by the environmental factors because a pavement is a structure which is exposed to, is an outdoor structure and therefore it is exposed to all kinds of environmental variations. So the temperature, moisture content, etc. Uh, keeps on varying. Now what is interesting and what is unique in this pavement design and which is different than uh, say many other civil engineering infrastructure design is that the allowable strength value for a pavement design 
is a function of the design traffic repetitions. So it does not assume a fixed value as if we bring the quick analogy of the beam again, we calculated the shear stress, we calculated the bending stress and we compared the values with the values that is allowable. That means the bending strength of the material, shear strength of the material and we did the design in such a way that the stresses generated does not exceed the allowable value and we did have fixed values of this allowable bending stress and the shear stress. It doesn't happen with the pavement structure. Uh, depending on how many traffic repetitions are expected for the pavement being designed, the allowable strain value is going to be different. Uh, we therefore need to know that what are the different types of distresses as in for the case of the beam we had bending and shear. We also need to know that what are the strains that can be linked to it and what are their critical locations. Researchers suggest that there are various ways a pavement can structurally deteriorate. Uh, among the various distresses, the researchers have identified five of them to be important. One is load fatigue, where uh, due to repetitive load application, uh, fatigue crack develops um, for the bound material and the crack propagates from bottom to top. Then we have rutting, which is the permanent deformation along the wheel path. Uh, this is contributed by, uh, you know, compaction after the pavement is open to the traffic uh, and also due to shear uh, movement of the material along the horizontal direction. Then we have low temperature shrinkage cracking uh, when the thermal stress developed due to restraint strain uh, exceeds the tensile strength of the material and the pavement gets cracked. Then we have a top down cracking where uh, cracking propagates from top uh, down as uh, traffic repetitions takes place. And we also have a thermal fatigue where the material deteriorates and it undergoes some kind of an aging uh, because uh, a pavement is exposed to a substantial variation of temperature. It becomes, uh, it goes from high temperature and low temperature and again it becomes high temperature and so on. So the material undergoes some kind of a thermal fatigue. Uh, it can link these trends to these distresses uh, through certain correspondence. So it is said that the tensile strain at the bottom of the bound layer, the, the bound layer could be a bituminous layer, could be a cemented layer, at the bottom of the bound layer is something which can be held responsible for fatigue. So if the strain value is higher, then we can say that the fatigue, uh, it will cause more fatigue and therefore fatigue life will be lower. Uh, for rutting, we think that the vertical strain at all the layers, the shear strain at all the layers are something which can be related to the rutting that is happening because rutting is a manifestation of these two uh, processes. One is the uh, subsequent compaction and another is the shear flow uh, contributed by all the layers. Uh, thermal shrinkage cracking, as I said, is uh, due to the situation where rest and strain, rest and axial strain uh, causes the thermal stress and that exceeds the strength of the material. Uh, researchers are still working on top-down cracking and then there are different varied opinion they tend to say that it is the shear stress or the strain or the tensile strain near the surface and that these are certain things uh, which can be related to the top-down cracking. And thermal fatty cannot be related to uh, strains, it is rather a material property. So we do uh, a mixed design in such a way that the material developed is resistant enough to uh, undergo this kind of extreme thermal variations. Now amongst all these factors, uh, possibly low temperature shrinkage cracking is the one which is not related to uh, repetitive loading or repetitive variations of uh, temperatures uh, which, is, which is what happens for the thermal fatigue. But in a stricture sense, uh, low temperature shrinkage cracking also can somehow be related to the number of repetitions. So in Practice, generally we see that uh, the load fatigue and rutting are the most popularly used distresses for the design purpose and that's what I'm going to discuss further uh, in my next slides. Uh, there are issues with the uh, laboratory studies, laboratory experimentations versus field. Uh, for example, if we take the case of fatigue, 
uh, in the laboratory we study uh, we subject an uh, bituminous beam to fatigue loading uh, repetitive loading and then we study uh, how its elastic modulus drops uh, with the number of repetitions and we have a definition of a laboratory fatigue life uh, that that means when the elastic modulus drops down to a pre-specified fraction of the original value we may call that as a laboratory fatigue now in the field we can't have that kind of a definition because in the field it's not very easy to uh, obtain the in situ elastic modulus and therefore in the field we make certain observations these observations are related to a characteristic fatigue crack that appears on the pavement surface so once again we uh, we observe that how the fatigue cracked area is increasing uh, with the traffic repetitions of course there are vehicles with all kinds of dimensions and axle loads and a lateral wander we do some kind of a conversion to convert them into a number of standard axle load repetitions so we may have certain predefined failure level that if the fatigue cracked area reaches this value then we can say that the pavement has failed from fatigue consideration now obviously there is there are a lot of differences with the uh, laboratory fatigue study versus the field fatigue study because in the laboratory we are testing on isolated bituminous mix and uh, in the field uh, there is nothing like an absolute uh, isolated beam uh, also the temperature and temperature conditions etc the env other environmental conditions are can be kept fixed the, the magnitude of the load etc can be kept fixed in the laboratory in the field it undergoes a lot of variations and sometimes we do use some kind of a conversion uh, to convert them into you know, certain standardized values but i think more importantly uh, there is a difference with their definition itself because the laboratory fatigue life uh, is defined with some criteria and a field fatigue life is defined with completely a different criteria and therefore a lot of adjustments are needed to you know link the laboratory fatigue life and that of the field fatigue life now uh, people have tried to take into account the variations that happens in the field as i said that uh, one try to break it into certain time segments and then try to find out something which is called damage damage we can define as the ratio of number of repetitions that's happening and divided by the number of repetitions that the material can sustain under that conditions and you can keep changing the condition the con one condition could be the load another condition could be the temperature and so on and what we do we add up these uh, fractional damages and it is said that whenever this summed up fractional damages uh, approach one then we can say the material has failed and that is how it is said that we can possibly include uh, the uh, gradual deterioration of the material that happens uh, as the traffic repetitions take place uh, but then there are issues uh, for example this cumulative damage principle was originally proposed by a scientist called uh, minor and he did certain studies uh, around 1940s on metals and uh, uh, his postulation used uh, an idea of uh, linear accumulation of damage so that means that uh, if certain number of repetitions is applied to a material then the extent of damage it undergoes and if the same amount of repetitions are applied to the material which is already in a much deteriorated state then uh, as per this principle the damage the additional damage will be the same in both the cases but which may not really be the case because we would expect possibly that the material which is heavily damaged a little bit of more repetition would cause more damage than if i would have applied that repetition when the material was freshly made so nevertheless we come up with something called transfer functions where the number of repetitions and the strain values are related by such empirical correspondence so if we go back to our original design flowchart that we developed we realize that transfer function is used here so we obtain the cumulative traffic repetitions and then apply the transfer function to obtain the allowable strain values we can do it either way also uh, that means instead of applying the transfer function here we can apply the transfer function here in the analysis it goes like this we do an analysis we find out the strain 
and then we apply the transfer function which is uh, nothing but a relationship between strain and number of repetition and therefore we will obtain the number of repetition that the pavement can sustain and therefore the design check instead of checking the strain values it can be in terms of checking the traffic repetition so we wanted to check whether the number of repetitions that the pavement can sustain is higher than the number of repetitions which are expected onto the pavement. Uh, one more time if we go back to our classical beam uh, design problem, uh, we can compare uh, the bending stress and the shear stress developed versus a level. We can also compare in terms of the bending moment and the shear force that is generated uh, and versus the bending moment and the shear force that this proposed structure can sustain. So in a beam design, we have therefore two kinds of distresses. One is bending, another is shear. And we have two design variables. One is the width of the beam, another is the height of the beam. It is said that height is more important or more critical parameter so far as the beam design is concerned. So if we refer this idea to our uh, pavement design for simplicity i have made uh, the pavement as a three layer structure uh, where we have bituminous layer and a granular layer and uh, our design parameters are the thicknesses of these two layers h1 and h2 these are our unknowns and uh, the two distresses that we are going to consider are uh, the load fatigue and rate now we can go to this design chart, we can slowly develop. So we have to remember that we are considering fatigue and rutting are the two distresses and we have H1 and H2 are the two design variables. So we can draw this kind of a graph where for simplicity we can think that let us fix uh, the thickness of the granular layer. Now we can do these iterations, we can do these iterations considering the allowable strain and the computed strain, or we can also do the iterations considering the number of repetitions that the pavement can sustain versus the number of repetitions that is expected. Both are in terms of standard accelerated repetitions, and we can get a point here. If we take a granular layer to be uh, higher than this one, then uh, since all the layers are participating uh, in the analysis, we would expect that the strain value uh, at the bituminous layer uh, will become lower and therefore uh, we, with the lesser thickness we will be able to manage them. So for given traffic and for given material properties, this is how I can get uh, individual points uh, and I can draw this and this is what we will call, if we have taken rutting then we will call that this as the rutting cut. Similarly, we can consider fatigue and we can obtain a fatigue cut. Now, if I take a particular point A uh, or a particular point B, and if we compare, uh, this is interesting because the H2, that is the granular layer thickness, is zero here. And this is what is known as uh, full depth between us. So if we compare between point A and point B, uh, obviously, uh, from the design considerations, the higher of the two will prevail. So if we are asked to design for a full depth bituminous pavement, we will uh, assign a value as that of A here. Now, if we consider a particular point, a point C, which is an intersection of the fatigue and the rutting curve, uh, here the pavement will fail simultaneously due to fatigue and rutting. Uh, it's not really so that we may like to choose this particular point uh, because we are not very sure whether it's a good idea that paper could fail simultaneously due to both of them or it is a good idea that say for example if you consider a point D and a point above D. So, so D is essentially not an acceptable design because uh, if we need a particular design traffic T then I have to choose the higher of the two so which is uh, the point somewhere above D on the fatigue. It is interesting uh, to look at the place where there is, we see that the car is turning back and this is where uh, is a situation which is corresponding to thin bituminous pavement. So we can see that here we will for a given H2 value, given value of the general layer, we will have two different values of the bituminous layer. Uh, that is because uh, when the bituminous layer thickness becomes very thin, 
then it comes under compression zone and therefore tension gradually so gradually it goes towards the compression zone and therefore you can still manage with a lesser thickness of the beautiful scale so both these uh, ends one is at a very high thickness as high as that you provide the full depth as the bituminous pigment and you provide no granular layer has certain advantage similarly very thin bituminous pigment uh, may have certain advantage because then fatigue no longer becomes a crucial factor for the design conservation and uh, we may possibly can construct certain pigments which have a uh, very thin bituminous layer but we have to make sure that the mix is strong enough from uh, shear considerations uh, <clears throat> so if we keep aside the lines which were going under design then we will be having this as our final design curve so i am dropping the line uh, the extension of the rutting curve which is going below the fatigue curve similarly i am dropping the line which is the extension of the fatigue curve which is going below the rutting curve because they are unsafe anyway. Now, if we consider which one to choose, as I said, that the intersection of these two may not necessarily be the best idea. One of the ways to look at it is possibly to look at the cost. And we can consider because each of these points, they are safe for the design traffic tree that T that has been considered. And uh, therefore we can compare their costs because each of these points will give the different values of H1 and H2. And I may consider certain unit cost of the bituminous and the granular layer. And most of the time uh, we will get a material cost uh, curve looking like this. Obviously full depth bituminous pavement, although it has certain advantage uh, for example, the water cannot accumulate within the granular layer because there is no granular layer, but it's going to be a very costly proposition. So if we compare the cost, most of the time, we will see that the intersection turns out to be the cheapest alternative. Uh, going ahead further, uh, if, if we consider two different design traffics, for example, T dash and T double dash, uh, where I can say, uh, T dash is higher than T double dash, then we can expect very well that the car will shift upward. So that means if I have to design for a higher uh, value of the design traffic, then we will follow the same iterative design principle and we will end up having getting a value uh, of the uh, bituminous and the granular thickness higher than uh, the one that we get it for T double dash. So uh, I must point you out that uh, it is uh, as these two curves shift, uh, L is the point of intersection here for design traffic T double dash, K is the point of intersection here for traffic T dash. Uh, these two points may not lie along the same horizontal line because they can shift. Uh, differently. It all depends on my computational results. Now, this is something uh, further interesting to think of. Uh, let us think of a, a rehabilitation uh, problem. So that means I am trying to, uh, I have designed a pavement for a particular traffic and then I am providing some, I need to provide some additional thickness, which is overlay or which is what is the rehabilitation uh, to sustain more traffic. So let us look at these points. Uh, so for example, I initially wanted to design uh, a pavement uh, for a, a traffic of T double dash. And therefore, uh, if I have chosen, this is the least cost uh, point, the L is the least cost. So if I am interested to pick up the, the design solution, which provides me the least cost, then uh, I shall be uh, providing Ln as my bituminous layer thickness and Mn as the granular layer thickness. Now, if after the expiry of the design traffic of T double dash, I need to provide an overlay, then uh, and I need to extend the life of the pavement further by T dash minus T double dash, then we, it may appear 
that we would provide the additional because we cannot really add any granule layer that has been already put underneath we may like to provide an additional thickness of oil but if you think it further uh, it's uh, not really correct because the alien bituminous layer uh, that has been provided for the first stage of the construction to take care of the design traffic t double dash so we need to know uh, after the expiry of the design traffic t double dash what is the uh, the current equivalent thickness if we can say equivalent thickness of the bituminous layer this graph will not suffice and for that we need to do a fresh design and that is the reason we need to know the current strength of the pavement and that is why we employ equipment like following a deflectometer which uh, tries to back calculate the current uh, elastic modulus of the pavement another uh, simple idea but that is highly un in economical is to consider that the entire alien thickness of the bituminous layer has completely deteriorated and has become a granular layer so i can redraw the alien thickness uh, here along the x axis and the l point can shift it uh, can be brought down and then we can say that the lmn becomes my equivalent granular layer which is of course uh, over designed because a deteriorated bituminous layer is not uh, equivalent not same as that of the granular layer so uh, this is how we do one cycle of rehabilitation but rehabilitation uh, over multiple cycle is really a complex job because we design a fresh pavement and then it undergoes deterioration then we find out its the current structural strength and then we provide additional thickness that undergoes deterioration further then we provide we do a design again and we provide additional thickness and it keeps on going and the material which was overlaid earlier in the previous round uh, undergoes deterioration and that partially adds to the granular layer thickness and the strength of the pavement so it goes on so the question the design question which is very complex because it involves prediction of how the pavement is going to behave in future this involves that what should be my timing of this individual rehabilitation not only rehabilitation we sometimes do a minor maintenance sometimes to rehabilitation a major maintenance sometimes we do recycling which is something a mixture of you know structural design as well as uh, mixed design recycling and sometimes if nothing works then we go for a reconstruction so uh, an appropriate scheduling of these activities in future so that the total uh, discounted cost of uh, the the agency as well as the users are minimized is a very complex optimization problem so if we again go uh, look at the design car further uh, as i said that if you increase the traffic the thickness uh, required will be high same is the uh, car if we increase uh, for example e3 e3 is the elastic modulus of the subgrade that is the lower most layer if we increase uh, the elastic modulus of the subgrade the thickness requirement obviously will be lower because if we do the design calculations we will see this uh, because the material becomes stronger and therefore the computed strength values will become lower and therefore a, a lesser thickness will suffice so this is how the car is going to uh, look if i am if i am doing a pavement uh, design and a construction on a subgrade which is stronger than the earlier one but uh, the issue becomes interesting that uh, if uh, the elastic modulus of the bituminous mix is increased that means you decide that you want to use a bituminous mix which has a higher elastic modulus than the your earlier design case uh, it is difficult to say whether the fatty curve will move up or down both for the traffic case we have seen that if traffic is increased it goes up if the modulus of the subgrade elastic modulus of the subgrade is increased it goes down but the if the elastic modulus of the bituminous mix is increased which can be achieved in different ways uh, i can change the grade of bitumen i can uh, you know change the gradation uh, i can use some kind of an additives and so on if i change the if i increase the elastic modulus Uh, it still becomes difficult to see the so the explanation is here look at these two parts the left side graph says 
that if elastic modulus of the bituminous mix is increased, the fatigue strain, fatigue strain, that means the tensile strain at the bottom of the bound layer, the bound layer is in this case the bituminous layer. So the fatigue strain will decrease, true, because as the material becomes any material, not only elastic modulus of bituminous mix, but any elastic modulus, if it is increased, then uh, the material, the pavement as a whole will become stronger because all the layers act together and therefore the strain value will gradually go down. That is true. So considering this, having a high elastic modulus of the bituminous mix is also a good idea, like having a high elastic modulus of the other layers is also a good idea. But then this becomes an issue that if you increase the elastic modulus of the bituminous mix by doing appropriate mix design, the material becomes stiff. And uh, in the laboratory, we observe that its fatigue life becomes, the material becomes stiff or the material becomes more brittle and therefore its fatigue life reduces. So it's a good idea to use uh, higher modulus, elastic modulus bituminous mix so you are inclined to do it. In the other hand, if you increase the higher modulus, elastic modulus of the bituminous mix, the material may become brittle and then its fatigue life will decrease. In the laboratory, uh, since uh, how much of strain I want to apply for performing fatigue testing is under my control. This is not so in the field because they become dependent. Uh, so depending on how much is your thickness, depending on what is the elastic modulus of the bituminous mix, your strain value is going to get affected. So this is where we have a paradox that, uh, so to achieve a higher fatigue life of the bituminous layer of the pavement, we need to use a bituminous mix with high elastic modulus, as well as a bituminous mix with a low elastic modulus. So one idea could be to try to optimize uh, and try to collaborate between a mix designer as well as a structural designer so as to find out the optimal uh, material, optimal elastic modulus and optimum kind of a mix design which will be able to serve the purpose of both. Uh, there are a few other interesting design solutions. For example, we can use uh, a, uh, we can use a double layer uh, while we are providing, while we are doing a construction, we can provide a bituminous layer with a lower elastic modulus at the bottom layer, and we can provide bituminous layer with a higher elastic modulus at the top layer. Now, this is how we are we are trying to exploit both the requirements that we wanted to have, because if we if we wanted to give a bituminous layer with low elastic modulus so that it does not become brittle, so that it serves my purpose of a good fatigue uh, mat material with good fatigue characteristics. And that's why we are providing a bituminous layer with low elastic modulus values. Uh, and uh, we are providing at the lower layer because the fatigue, uh, the, the, the bottom of fatigue cracking is starting from this place. But we cannot have this low elastic modulus of bituminous layer uh, for the entire thickness, because if we do so, then uh, the strain value will become higher, which is again detrimental to us. So what we tend to do, uh, we tend to provide in the, when we are doing the construction of the next sub layer, we try to increase the elastic modulus of the bituminous layer of the top surface, uh, so that uh, this higher elastic modulus helps me to reduce the strain. So this is how we can have a two-layer bituminous pavement construction where we can enjoy both as high, higher fatigue life due to a softer material as well as lower strain due to high stiffness material. And this is for the same reason uh, manufacturers are trying with different additives so that uh, the, the bituminous material, its fatigue uh, property improves uh, without compromising with the issues related to elastic modulus. The other idea is to have a bituminous layer and gradually uh, change its bitumen content. This is also possible easily at the time of construction. So we provide, uh, this, is, this is what is called the rich bottom bituminous pavement. So we provide more bitumen at the lower portion so that it becomes soft and it becomes fatigue resistant. And as we go up, 
we uh, reduce the vitamin content a little bit so that it contributes to the strength and reduces this, uh, reduces the strength. So <clears throat> I have almost come to the end of my presentation. The structural design uh, of pigment uh, a complex and involved process and we have many objectives to satisfy. For example, we wanted uh, the pavement to be structurally adequate. So that means the pavement design does not fail prematurely. There are other issues involved. Uh, for example, the, the material shows huge amount of uh, variability. So that means when I'm taking the elastic modulus of the bituminous layer, say 3000 megapascal, it may not necessarily be 3000 megapascal, it has its own variability. So how to consider this variability of the individual layers, of the individual materials, the variability of the traffic, because traffic is something which is highly uncertain because if you are constructing a pavement where uh, in, in, uh, in a region where there is no pavement, there is no road, so you have to uh, entirely predict how much traffic is expected to use that particular road. So traffic prediction also involves a lot of variability. And therefore, the recent idea is to include uh, the reliability uh, also in the pavement design. So that means when we say that this pavement is able to sustain uh, 20 million standard axles, we also have to say that at what reliability it is able to sustain. So this is our one expectation. The other expectation is that the pavement design should be cost effective. Uh, as I have shown you that there are various design alternatives which are available. So we may like to pick up the one which is the cheapest design solution amongst the various alternatives. But uh, picking up the design solution which is most cheap has also certain disadvantage because you may end up uh, picking up a design which is not so reliable. So that means it's premature failure cannot be guaranteed or it has a less reliability uh, of the, the structural design itself may have a less reliability uh, than something which is probably costly. So it becomes a, a balance that a structural designer has to do that how to make a pavement design which is structurally adequate at the same time reliable at the same time uh, is cost effective. And the third requirement is also that we want the uh, pavement design uh, to be environment friendly uh, because uh, there are a uh, lot of uh, materials that has been used and the naturally available materials are gradually get, becoming uh, scarce and uh, there are at the same time a lot of industrial, agricultural, domestic, uh, wastes and building and construction material wastes that is coming up. So a set of researchers are continuously striving that how to uh, make use of these materials and we can reduce if they are hazardous how to reduce their uh, hazardousness and then we can use them effectively uh, to the pavement as highway materials and the moment you are changing a material with a new material this becomes an unconventional material so you need to study in details their engineering property their performance property so as to be able to design a pavement which is structurally adequate and you are very reliable about the design that you have performed. So these are various complex tasks that a pavement designer uh, are expected to satisfy. Is uh, although there cannot be a very uh, you know simple single answer to a pavement design problem. So with that, I would like to thank uh, uh, NIT Jalandhar for inviting me. I also thank uh, my institute. Uh, uh, and also my all my students. Thank you very much. If there are questions, then I can take up these questions. Uh, thank you so much, sir. So I request the participants now put up the queries in chat box. And uh, please uh, don't switch on your um, or unmute your mics. So put your queries in chat box only. <laughs> 